Hello and welcome back to the Reapers. Today we're doing a video looking at aircraft control surfaces. Now this has been a heavily requested video and I'm finally getting around to it, my apologies. Now the reason a lot of people want this video is that a lot of guys watch our channel and watch the missions that we do, the mission videos, and hear us talking about various stuff like flaps, rudders, ailerons, elevators and stuff like that but because they don't have any kind of aviation background then they don't really know what I'm, what we're talking about. Now I'm going to do my best to keep this as brief and as an overview as possible. I'm going to try and avoid going into the details but I do have a tendency to get a bit distracted as you're probably aware. Now before we can talk about the control surfaces we need to understand the three axes of aircraft movement. An aircraft can move over three axes. The first axis is if we look at the plane side on, we imagine a pivot point in the center mass of the aircraft. Then if we roll the aircraft around that pivot, so let's say the tail we roll up, the nose we roll down, that is the aircraft moving in the pitch axis, moving down in the pitch axis. Next we look at roll. Again, imagine a head-on axis in the center mass of the plane. Imagine we roll so that the right wing is going down and the left wing is going up. Then we're rolling right in the roll axis. And finally, if we look from a plan view above, we put an imaginary axis again in the center mass and we twist it so that the nose is going right and the tail is going left, then we're rotating it right in the yaw axis. So we've got pitch, roll and yaw axes. Next, we're going to look at the non-controllable surfaces. So if I put this overlay here, we can see that crudely highlighted in blue are obviously the wings. And the wing's primary job is to create an upwards force, a force with an upwards vector known as lift, which keeps our plane airborne. Then at the rear in red, we've got the horizontal stabilizers. And the primary job of this is to keep the aircraft stable in the pitch axis. If you've seen a video when we've had our horizontal stabilizers shot off, then the plane will suddenly be under unstable in the pitch axis and it'll either point up in the pitch axis violently with the nose going up or point down violently lose control and crash and then yellow we've got the vertical stabilizer this keeps the aircraft stable in the yaw axis and if this gets shot off or is removed then the plane no longer has stability in yaw and it will yaw to the left or yaw to the right until it departs flight and crashes the first control surface we'll look at is the ailerons mounted on the trailing edge of the wings. So I'm going to wiggle the stick left and right and you can see the ailerons moving. So I've got my stick slewed completely to the left now which will roll the plane left and how it does that if we look at the right aileron you can see it's angled down a bit now. Now the reason for this is that it exaggerates the airfoil, the shape of the wing. The airfoil is what gives the wing lift. Now if we exaggerate the airfoil of the wing, then this section at the end of the wing where the aileron is, is going to generate extra lift. That's going to push this right wing upwards. If we go to the opposite side, you can see that the opposite aileron is pointing upwards. This inverses the lift force created by the airfoil because it's essentially inverting the airfoil and this will create a downwards force on this wing. So this wing is pushing down, right wing is pushing up. The plane is going to roll left around the longitudinal axis of the plane. Now, generally speaking, the further outwards towards the edges of the wings the ailerons are, the more effect they'll have. Also, the larger the ratio of aileron area to wing area is going to have the most effect of roll. And generally speaking, the less the wingspan of the plane, so the shorter and stubbier the wings are, the faster and better it's going to roll. Next we have the elevator. So on the rear of the horizontal stabilizers, we have the elevator. Stick forward, stick back, stick forward, stick back. Let's pause that. So this is going to cause the aircraft to climb. So we can see like the left aileron now, the elevator is inverting the airfoil so that we're creating a downwards force at the rear of the plane there. That's pushing the tail, the rear end down. And the aircraft will now seesaw it will pivot over the center of lift, which is invariably the center of the wing, so just below the cockpit there, which will lift the nose of the aircraft up, and we're creating and we're creating an increase in the pitch axis, i.e. pulling up. And if we unpause and hover that down, exactly the opposite, we're now exaggerating the airfoil of the horizontal stabilizer, which does the opposite and will cause the plane to dive. Next is the rudder at the back attached to the vertical stabilizer. Now the rudder is not to be confused with the rudder in a ship. The rudder in a ship or a boat is primarily there to, in to make the vehicle turn left or right. But in an aircraft in general flight, the rudder's primary function is to induce a condition known as your slip or just slip. So if we look down the your axis of the aircraft, now if we imagine a condition where the aircraft is moving up the runway, forwards along the runway, but 
is rotated around the yaw axis so that the nose was 45 degrees to the left, the tail was 45 degrees to the right, then it would have a yaw slip of 45 degrees. Now it does have a secondary function of turning the plane and it, it will turn the plane slightly in general flight. It also induces a third force. Now if we look at the vertical stabilizer or the tail compared with the wings and the horizontal stabilizers, you'll note that the wings are mirrored over the longitudinal axis and the same with the horizontal stabilizers so, the, so those two balance each other out but the tail is above the roll axis but does not go below the roll axis so it creates an additional force of roll so if I were flying an aircraft in general flight with a lot of rudder like that then it would induce a lot of roll and I'd have to cancel that out with an opposite amount of aileron so the next two surfaces we're going to look at are flaps and slats. It's debatable whether you can call these actual control surfaces, but I'd like to include them in the video nonetheless. So we're going to have to get airborne to show these off. Okay, so we're airborne now. If we look at the leading edges of this left wing, as we can see it, what we'll see is a transformation when we get below a certain speed, and we just saw it there, automatically a leading edge slat has extended. These are not controlled by the pilot, but they are extended automatically by the machine when the airspeed gets below a certain point. So when you're getting very slow and you're getting near a stool and the aircraft is flying at a higher angle of attack, these slats have the effect of giving the wing a higher coefficient of lift. An interesting story I've got on these is a guy who actually used to fight against this aircraft in reality. And he knew the weaknesses of the slats on this BF-109 was that if you had an aircraft like a Spitfire that did not have leading edge slats, you could force this BF-109 into a fight where it would have to fly at a certain amount of yaw, i.e. rotation in the yaw axis. And because of a design fault in these slats, they would extend at slow speeds, but when they try to retract, they would get jammed. Only one side of the slat would retract, and the other side would get jammed out, increasing drag and ruining the efficiency of the overall wing airfoil in normal flight. It was a nice little trick they could use against the BF-109s. Next, we're going to look at the wing trailing edge flap. So if we look at the trailing edge of the wing on this left wing, and we look at the inner 50%, I'm going, to start, I'm going to start extending the flaps now. Now, it takes a few seconds to go get to fully extended, so just bear with me and watch the change in the trailing edge shape. That's them fully extended. Let me pause there. These are surfaces that significantly increase the lift created by the wings and if we go and look at a sectional view here you can see how they massively exaggerate the airfoil of the wing and give a massive increase in lift so any aircraft that they're going to be using flaps are going to be using these to fly slowly and they're going to be using flaps almost exclusively when they're landing not only do flaps give you more lift at lower speeds but they also allow you to fly your aircraft at lower angles of attack at these lower speeds, which is essential when landing the aircraft. And if you don't know what angle of attack is, then we'll go through that in more detail with your slip in a different video. So you're probably thinking, well, why don't they just design the wing with this kind of airfoil in the first place, with this big exaggerated airfoil with the trailing edge hanging down like that? Well, there's always a bad side, and the bad side is that it massively increases the drag of the aircraft. If we looked at it from a front section, you can see that the section of the thickness of the wing presented to the airflow is pretty much doubled on the inner 50% of the wing. And so the top speed of this aircraft will be significantly reduced in the overall performance. Hence, they're retractable and you'd only use them in certain situations like landing. So we move on a few years later to a Korean War era jet. And let's see what differences we've got. Well, we've got the ailerons. Now, the ailerons look pretty much the same and they work the same. But the major difference that I see is their increased surface area size in comparison to the wing. Now, the reason for that is that you can see that these, this was one of the first aircraft with swept, heavily swept back wings. The reason they did that is because they needed to, to push the aircraft's envelope to not supersonic, but to transonic near the speed of sound. And to do that, you have to sweep the wings back significantly. Now, the problem is when you sweep the wings back significantly like this, you get wind slippage and other such effects which significantly reduce the effectiveness of the ailerons. So the first thing you can do is massively increase the size of the ailerons. And if we go up here, you can see 
massive size of the ailerons compared to the BF109. As well as that, you can have other fixes. So if uh, I can't point it out, but you can see the bit sticking out in the leading edge, top middle of the wing, you've got what's called a wing fence. So one of the problems with these swept wings is that wind would hit the leading, leading edge of the wing. And rather than travel over the wing in a laminar flow, creating lift and all the benefits of the wing, the wind would prefer to slip down the wing and off the edge in the tip of the wing in a vortex so wing fences were like this installed into most of these similar era aircraft to stop that happening and the wing fences would therefore also increase the effectiveness of the aileron we've also got flaps pretty much the same as in the bf109 we've got the vertical stabilizer and the rudder pretty much the same slightly bigger in comparison to the size of the aircraft but otherwise the same and then we've got the horizontal stabilizer which for the first time is no longer a fixed piece of the body it now moves with the elevator and the elevator itself is only partially differential from the horizontal stabilizer now the reason that we'd had to have the inclusion of an all moving horizontal stabilizer or an all moving elevator like this is because of the effects of when an aircraft gets near the speed of sound i.e transonic and you get pressure waves of air build up on this horizontal stabilizer surface leading to massive reduced effectiveness of an only moving elevator so for instance if we had a uh, bf109 and it was diving and it got transonic near the speed of sound which happened then the elevator being the only moving bit at the back of the horizontal stabilizer would essentially stop working and the plane would either crash or when it got down to the thicker air and it slowed down then they would regain control a plane like this, however, had an all-moving horizontal stabilizer slash elevator, which cured the problem. This aircraft also has the retractable leading edge slats in the front of the wings, but uh, I don't really need to show them off. Now, the other addition that this plane brings is a speed brake. So I'm going to pop the speed brake out here. This aircraft has them on the left and right at the rear quarter of the fuselage. And the speed brake is obviously to play, slow the plane down, so it's going to spoil the airflow, increase the overall drag, if the aircraft had to suddenly decrease its speed. Next, we'll skip even further into the future. So this is a 1980s Su-27 flanker, and we see a lot of the same stuff repeated. We've got the wing leading edge slats, which are this time extended on the ground, and we can see the absolute massive size of them spanning 90% of the leading edge. We've also got the vertical stabilizers. We've got two, in, two of them in this case, and they've got the rudder, but essentially they're the same as we've looked at before. We also have the air brake. It's on the top, as you can see, massive air brake on the flanker. Creates a huge amount of drag, as we can see from the front there. We've got our ailerons on the back of the wings. As you can see, I'm moving the stick left and right. Now, the thing about the ailerons is you'll notice that they are on the inner side of the wing rather than the outer side and that's strange because as you remember I said that the most effective the ailerons will be is the further they are towards the outside of the wing. Now before we leave the ailerons I'm going to put the flaps down. That's the flaps down. Now note it's the same control surface as the ailerons and when we have an airplane that shares control surfaces with a flap and an aileron then we call them flapperons and so even when the flaps are extended like this then we can still use them as ailerons. It just changes their range of motion accordingly. And another thing we can look at here is with the flap on fully extended down on the left here and the leading edge slap fully extended, we can see the massive exaggeration in airfoil with the front of the wing of the airfoil drooping down and the rear of the airfoil drooping down. It's a hugely exaggerated wing airfoil that's going to produce many times more lift at lower speeds. Next, we're going to go back and look at the elevators. So stick forwards stick backwards whopping great elevators on a plane like this now note they're single piece this time so rather than being split like the 109 and split like in the f86 they're one moving piece and notice that the entire piece moves as well exactly as we spoke about before with the saber if you want to approach the speed of sound or go through the speed of sound you have to have an all moving piece the other important thing to point out with these elevators is that they're not actually really elevators at all. When you move the stick forwards and backwards, they are elevators. When you move the stick left and right, as well as the ailerons moving or the flapperons moving, these elevators also move opposite to each other. And that's because as well as being used for pitch, they can also be used for rotating the plane around the roll axis. And that was why I pointed out that the ailerons don't have to be so effective with this aircraft because a lot of the roll control is actually from these surfaces at the back. And because of this, they're not called elevators. They're a mix mixture between ailerons and elevators known as elevons. So at the trailing edge of the wings, we've got flapperons. And at the back here, we've got elevons. 
These elevons on a modern plane like this are so effective and cr can create such a moment of roll of an aircraft that you can essentially lose an entire wing and balance the aircraft out just with these elevons. You can see the size of them in comparison with their wing. They're like half the size of the wing, which is why they give such a large moment of torque in the roll and massive moment of torque in the pitch as well. They create much more pitch than the plane can ever deal with. Now, if you want proof of this, fly an SU-27 in DCS, press the S key to turn off the flyby wire, pull the elevator right back like that, and you'll see that the plane would immediately flip on its back or explode because you're creating such huge torque forces in the pitch. Now the only other thing I'd like to point out I've just spotted on this SU-27 is that below the vertical stabilizers dangling down from the bottom rear of the planes it has two dorsal anti-spin fins. These are not controllable but just so you know why they're there, they're there to keep your stability if the aircraft is dropping down. So you imagine that the aircraft's dropping down through itself if it's entering a flat spin from a very slow maneuver then because the aircraft is dropping down through its own compressed air, the vertical stabilizers at the top are no longer doing any job. They're no longer giving any your stability. So in this case, these lower dorsal fins become makeshift vertical stabilizers and help to keep your stability, help to keep the plane from getting in a flat spin, which is a major problem for all aircraft. So there we have it. We've gone over the basics of the control surface. I hope that was useful and I'll see you later.